Ladies and gentlemen, our program will now begin. Please welcome the CEO of the Churchill Group, Karen Tucker. Thank you so very much. My name is Karen Tucker. I'm CEO at the Churchill Club. And for those who are not familiar, we are a nonprofit independent forum with a mission to encourage innovation, economic growth, and societal benefit. Have a big special thanks to our co-presenter, Cambridge in America, a group of Cambridge University alumni and friends that supports the university and its 31 member colleges. There are 15,000 Cambridge alumni in the US and about 3,000 of those are in California. Not surprisingly, many in computer science and technology, a Raspberry Pi, ARM, and our wonderful sponsor, Bromium, are among the important companies that were started there. So the, our audience tonight is a mix of our two communities, which are coming together uh, as one to hear from our distinguished speakers, Lord Martin Rees and Will Marshall. Before we jump into that discussion, I would like to introduce you to Simon Crosby. Simon is founder and CEO of Bromium. He will introduce Will, who will then introduce our guest of honor. And I wanted to say about Simon that in addition to his strong support for Cambridge in America, he is also a supporter of the Churchill Club. He has spoken on our stage multiple times, and he is the type of individual who walks the talk to support the community resources that he believes are important. Thank you very much, Simon. Welcome. Thanks. Thank you, Karen. Actually, my role here tonight is to show you the best of British. <coughs> yeah, eat it, Silicon Valley, eat it. Um, I'd, first of all, I'd like to thank Karen for her partnership. You know, we have at Cambridge Churchill College, and she is CEO of the Churchill Club, and there is this tantalizingly fabulous relationship growing between Cambridge in America and the Churchill Club. And I anticipate and look forward to many more events. Thank you for your support. We've never been able to put this wonderful group together without your help. Thank you. So tonight we are really privileged to have two fabulous folk. Um, we'll forgive one for not being a Cambridge graduate, the gentleman I'm about to introduce you, um, to talk, to take us on a conversation through a topic which is really of great importance to us all. Um, it has consequences for us on a short time scale as more and more things go AI, and it has consequences for our entire society and our planet on a longer time scale. And so it's a great privilege to have Will uh, Martin lead us through uh, the conversation. He's, Karen called him our conversation guide, but he's so superbly qualified to lead us through this uh, interesting topic. Um, I have to recite your pedigree, just so everybody knows. Um, he, so um, he has a PhD in physics from Oxford, and that's why I had to recite your pedigree. <laughs> we'll forgive you for that. Um, and he has a space and technology from the University uh, of Leicester thereafter. So this is the breast of British. We're going to show you what it, what it can do to you, and, and we're going to show you why the world ought to care. Um, if you're tweeting, please use ca um, CanTab USA or um, uh, Churchill Club. The Twitter codes are in your, in your program. But I'm about to hand over to Will. Thank you so much for attending. Thanks very much. Um, can everyone hear me OK in the back? <laughs> yes, looks like it. OK, so I'm getting a few nods at least. Oh, that's good. Um, so firstly, my job is to introduce uh, Martin here. Um, I've known Martin for many years, and uh, um, uh, Martin uh, is uh, 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 an astronomer and cosmologist by background, and has, is really one of the foremost in that field. And uh, I study physics, and I have a great amount of awe for him. And uh, uh, he's also the Astronomer Royal, uh, a post he's had since 1995. Prior to that, he was also and amongst numerous other achievements, the president of the Royal Society, um, uh, which is like the National Academy of Sciences in the UK, uh, a little bit older, by the way. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, and also, uh, uh, he, he was master of Trinity College, Cambridge, which is also in itself a pretty prestigious 
uh, thing to be, um, for those of you who don't know the Cambridge system, Trinity is a very uh, uh, a prestigious college, and I think I read somewhere that um, um, it has slightly more uh, Nobel Prizes in physics than France or something, and this is <laughs> one of its claims to fame, because um, the English and the French have a nice uh, bit of a tension going on. Anyway, uh, so, uh, but, but uh, you know, it's really an honor to have this conversation um, uh, with you, Martin, and, and uh, perhaps um, I can kick it off by uh, trying to, we, we're going to talk about a number of topics, about space, about AI, and about, um, um, and about uh, the future of technology and, and uh, its role in humanity. And, and I, I, I sort of wanted to start by bringing us back down to Earth, actually, and because half of this audience uh, may understand these quirks of the British system and half might not, but you're Lord Rees and you're the Astronomer Royal. And, <laughs> What does that mean? Like, what, what does a lord do? And uh, what, what does Astronomer <laughs> Royal, are you, yeah. are you out there teaching Prince William how to study the stars? Or what does that mean for those uh, of us that aren't from uh, Britain? Uh, well, I'll tell you sort of about Astronomer Royal. Um, I was once uh, um, interviewed by an Indian tycoon. And, and he heard of Astronomer Royal. He said, do you do the Queen's horoscopes? Oh, dear. <laughs> uh, 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 I said, well, if she wanted one, I'm the person she'd ask. <laughs> and he looked very serious, and he asked me for my predictions, and I said, stock markets will fluctuate, trouble in the Middle East, and other deep insights like that. He paid deep attention, but then I came clean, and I said, I'm just a scientist. And he then lost all interest in my predictions. <laughs> and, and rightly so, because uh, scientists are rotten forecasters, almost as bad as economists. Okay, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, but to, to answer your question, Astronomer Royal was a real job, uh, it was the person who ran the Greenwich Observatory, but that became a museum after about the 1950s when we could have telescopes and fly to them on good sites elsewhere, and then it became just an honorary title like Poet Laureate, and uh, my uh, main job is, as you know, being a professor at Cambridge. Right. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you, and I hope that clarifies things for everyone. Um, so uh, let's dive into some mm. uh, uh, intellectual topics. So mm. uh, uh, I wanted to sort of start from space, but, mm -hmm. but from near space outwards, if you like, because mm -hmm. there's a number of different mm -hmm. topic areas. So uh, in near space, we've seen quite a bit of a revolution going on uh, with SpaceX and mm -hmm. uh, um, companies putting up satellites like ours and others, uh, and it's changing the game a little bit. Uh, what do you make of all of this? I mean, mm -hmm. obviously, there was Apollo back in the day, yes, but like, yes. this is, is, something else is going yes. on here. What do you make of that? Well, it's very interesting if we do go back to uh, 50 years, and uh, I'm old enough, as I guess some of the audience here are, to remember when uh, uh, men on the moon were something futuristic. Um, and there's a big generation gap because uh, you've got to be middle-aged to remember when men walked on the moon. You're far too young to remember it, I'm sure, um, because the last man on the moon was 1972, wasn't it? Um, and to our students today, uh, men on the moon is ancient history. They know that the Americans landed men on the moon. They know the Egyptians built pyramids. And both these seem uh, 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 activities motivated by strange national goals. And, of course, what we do know, of course, is that uh, uh, putting men on the moon was done by uh, a nation inspired by superpower rivalry. And that's why, of course, it wasn't followed up. I mean, at the time, I am old enough to remember this, of course, uh, and we thought that 10 years later there'd be footprints on Mars. And there would have been if they kept the momentum, because at the time of Apollo, 4% um, of the federal budget was going to NASA. That's right. It's now 0.6%. And if they ramped it up again, they could do this. But, of course, uh, we've had uh, manned space flights being relegated to circling the Earth, mainly in the space station. But, of course, uh, technology has proceeded the pace. We depend on space every day for um, uh, communications and uh, um, environmental monitoring and all that. Um, and uh, also for science, we depend hugely on satellites for uh, uh, telescopes. And, of course, we've had these wonderful probes uh, bringing back pictures of uh, distant worlds. And in particular, uh, we've had uh, two probes in the last couple of years. Um, one was the European Space Agency's Rosetta, which landed a uh, uh, robot on a comet. And the other was the New Horizons, NASA, which sent back pictures from Pluto. And those were amazing. Um, and uh, the, the Pluto one was amazing because um, uh, it sent back pictures from 10,000 times further away than the moon. 
Proudhon. Um, and the other remarkable thing about those two technologies, uh, two, two spacecraft, was that they were based on 1990s technologies yeah. because they both took 10 years on their journey and, of course, five years in the planning stage. And when we think of how smartphones have developed in 15 years since then, we realize how much better we could do today uh, in terms of miniaturized space probes. And, of course, this leads into the kind of things that you're doing, or your company, because uh, y you are uh, building this marvelous system of small uh, spacecraft, and I really like your mantra that you can observe every tree in the world every day with your system. And uh, uh, this is possible because, I guess, of uh, the technology which has uh, become much cheaper and much more miniaturized. Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, I think the main trend here is that in... in is the miniaturization of technology has allowed us to put uh, more, more um, capability per kilogram going into mm -hmm. the rockets, if you like. Uh, so it's interesting, having bought many rockets, um, the rocket prices have stayed roughly flat for the mm -hmm. last uh, mm -hmm. 40 years, um, uh, but, the, uh, but, the, uh, but the, what you can put in there has changed mm -hmm. dramatically, mm -hmm. and, like several orders of magnitude, even it's just in the last sort of mm -hmm. um, 10 years, and mm -hmm. uh, that has change the game and so you can launch these large constellations it's quite mm -hmm. quite mm -hmm. different and people are we're doing that with earth imaging at planet labs our little company and but there's other people also planning communication satellites and they can bring a different sort of capability um including this imaging of the whole planet every mm -hmm. day which mm -hmm. which you know helps with lots of sustainable development mm -hmm. problems and mm -hmm. and and challenges that humans are facing and communication satellites could equally bring internet to the people mm -hmm. in mm -hmm. rural regions and so forth so i think there's some practical applications of that but let's move a little bit further out. I mean, you mentioned about you know, the Apollo program dying, and that was, of course, national, uh, national uh, trends, if you like. Mm -hmm. um, what, uh, uh, but now we're seeing other people talking about doing this on a purely private basis, mm -hmm. and certainly with SpaceX and Elon talking about yes. uh, going to Mars and other yes, people talking yes. about going to the moon. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, you, you know, uh, and one of the reasons people talk about doing that is to back up humanity and the rest of life. Uh, mm. I'm curious to know, what, what do you make of that uh, yes. uh, uh, the, as, well, the, as the yes. Uh, objective? Yes, I mean, I'll defer discussing the objective, but let's think what's happening. And I, I'm a huge enthusiast for these private programs. And the reason it, for that is that uh, the practical case for sending people into space is getting weaker all the time. Um, because yeah. miniaturization allows you to do more Instruments can do the same thing. Instruments and robots yeah. are going to be uh, uh, more, uh, more powerful. And uh, uh, I imagine that we'll have really sophisticated robots going to, to Mars that really understand geology. And also that we'll have huge fabricators building big structures up in space without people. And uh, therefore, the only reason people would want to go into space is essentially as an adventure. Right. Um, the pioneering spirit. And uh, uh, I think they'll be the people who uh, sign up for um, uh, uh, the project being run by Elon Musk and uh, Bezos, etc. And I think what's great about these projects is that they can cut prices, partly because they're sort of new companies, but also because they accept higher risks. I think the trouble with the, uh, uh, the, the NASA uh, shuttle program was it was too risk averse. It was launched nearly 140 times. There were two failures. Each was a trauma and held back the program for three years because it was billed as safe. Um, and, uh, uh, the they privateers said, don't care. Well, well the, 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 that's right. I mean, uh, test pilots and uh, uh, crazy adventurers are happy to accept a 2% risk. Right. And I think uh, um, they'll be the kind of people who will go on these things. And I think it's a big mistake to use the phrase space tourism because that lulls people into thinking it's safe. Yeah. And I think Richard Branson is making a mistake using this right. phrase in particular, uh, because space, it, it, space adventurism. Yeah, space or, adventurism. Because uh, um, otherwise, the first accident will uh, will, will be another trauma. So it's got to be adventure. And the people who go, um, maybe going just in a low Earth orbit, is going to be fairly routine. But then, of course, as we know, um, they're selling tickets for the first trip round the moon. It's a five-day trip. Um, I was told maybe. This wasn't true that they sold a ticket for the second flight, but not the first flight. I don't know if that's true. <laughs> um, but, but if they're I, sensible, they send some animals on the first flight. Well, uh, yeah. <laughs> yes, um. I, I, um, but, uh, and then, of course, going to Mars. Um, but, uh, but, uh, but I do think that uh, if we look 50 years ahead, maybe even less, there will be small communities of people living on Mars. Um, but they, uh, they'll be intrepid pioneers, rather like um, 
uh, the guy who fell supersonically from a high altitude Matt balloon. Phoenix, um, or yes, or um, Bowell, Bowell, right? And in Britain, we have people like that. It's a chap called Lana Fines, who who's um, who dragged a sledge across the Antarctic in winter right. and right. done other crazy things. So it'd be people like that, and they will go and accept the risks, and they will uh, produce a settlement on Mars. Um, I think. We're kidding ourselves if we think that Mars is planet B, as it were, we can escape. And, and the one thing where I didn't agree with Elon Musk was when he talked about sending people 100 at a time and establishing a sort of uh, community of normal people living there. I think it'll only be uh, um, people who really like adventures. But I think we should cheer them on. And there's another reason, actually, if I can go on a minute, uh, why, why I, I look forward to that. And that's that if we imagine that it's happening 50 years from now then we know from all the other technologies that we might talk about later um, that um, th th they will um, have access to um, the ability to genetically modify themselves and their progeny and cyborg techniques and all the rest of it. Now, I suspect we are going to try to uh, regulate these uh, uh, techniques here on Earth. Here, here on Earth mm -hmm. okay? I think we'll fail, but we'll try to. Um, but, of course, uh, these people will be far beyond the uh, reach of any regulator. We wish them good luck because they'll have every incentive because humans are very ill-adapted to living on Mars. They'll have every incentive to adapt themselves by all genetic techniques, all cyborg techniques. And uh, I think uh, they will be the, f uh, the precursors of a post-human species because within two or three generations, they won't be humans, whether they'll be entirely electronic or whether there'll be some modification, we don't know. But, but th that transition from human to, to post-human is going to happen, I think, not on Earth, but from these pioneers. Good. And that's why we should doubly cheer them on. <laughs> well, that's fascinating. And uh, let me just offer one course correction <laughs> from my prediction, yes, which is that yes. it's not going to be on Mars. And I, I have debated with Elon about this extensively yes. because... Uh, um, it's much, much easier to do it on the moon, it turns out, and there's all the resources there. And we did this study project uh, once uh, in a workshop where we really thought through, and it, it turns out with just a few billion dollars, you could put a self-sustainable settlement on the moon in a much shorter time frame than on Mars, because Mars is just the distances oh, yeah, and, yeah. and so forth. But people and, might prefer Mars. But, uh, they may, but it, it, mm. it's, it's so much technically harder. Oh, sure. Uh, and, yeah, yeah. Uh, that it's just going to be uh, out. And they have one-way one one trips, one-way tickets, and uh, sure. Elon himself says he wants to die on Mars, but not on impact. Right, right, right. right, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, and, uh, it's, it's, it's true. Uh, and I think he's 45 years old now, so within 40 years, he can probably do this. Yeah, exactly. Mm. No, that's mm. exactly right. Um, but I'd want to be a bit older before I go. So, so um, and, and, and by the way, I, I, I subscribe to the idea that it's not a bad idea also from the backing up humanity. I mean, it's stupid to have a hard drive. You know, you never keep, uh, you always have a backup of your hard drive and then we don't keep a backup <laughs> of life. And it's not, the, it's not a black and white solution to no, no, all no, no. the threats. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, if a supernova goes off nearby, we're fucked whether we're on, excuse my friend, um, on the moon or on Mars mm. or on the Earth. But... But if, uh, you know, other threats, it, it does reduce. Yes, yes. Um, and the main threats, as we have discussed later, are from us, not from uh, of nature. Course, yeah. Of course, mm -hmm. of course. Mm -hmm. um, so um, let me move on a little bit. So let's set, set out a little bit towards, mm -hmm. um, uh, towards other planets. Uh, you've just been at a conference today about mm -hmm. um, uh, finding other planets, mm -hmm. uh, exoplanets. Um, there's, you know, when uh, there's, a, you know, there was eight or n nine planets, and then they reduced it to eight, and now there's thousands. So, uh, where's this all going? Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, what's very exciting in astronomy is realizing that almost every star you see in the sky is orbited by a retinue of planets, um, and there are probably billions of Earth-like planets in the galaxy, and uh, uh, we find more and more. Um, uh, very strange systems, some around very faint so-called dwarf stars. Uh, there was a system found just last year where there are seven planets orbiting around a star which is 1% as bright as the sun. So on these planets, um, your year lasts only a few days, and the other planets would whiz by, and they look as big as the moon in the sky as they whiz by. A very exciting place to live. And some of these planets are in what's called a habitable zone, which is a, a zone where water can exist, neither boiling away nor staying frozen. And it's thought that uh, that's a necessary condition for life. It may not be true, but it's, a, no. it's the best bet to start with those. Um, and uh, uh, th this, of course, raises a question, does habitable mean inhabited? Right. 
I was just going to say, I mean, yeah. it's an astronomer's dream to be there. How they, can there not be astronomers on that, <laughs> on that system? So, yeah, let, yes, let, yes. Well, I'll tell you one thing. If, um, uh, there's one feature of this particular, uh, uh, these particular systems. Because they're, they're small, um, the um, planetary orbits are tidally locked. Uh, um, uh, presenting the same face to the star, just like the moon is tightly locked to the Earth. So there'd be a, a, a real, segre- real apartheid between astronomers and all the rest of the community. Because astronomers would want to be on the dark side, uh, the dark hemisphere, looking right. away. And everyone else would want to be in the light side. So right, right, right. Uh, astronomers, if they exist on these worlds, would be segregated from everyone else. Well, it might be a good thing. It might be pe- yeah. better for both parties. Yeah. Um, so, so, uh, right. <laughs> and, uh, so, what, now let, so, so there's all these planets, yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. but where are the people? I mean, you well, know, where, yeah. are they, where there's life? I mean, Fermi s- stated the yeah. problem. Uh, mm-hmm. What's your answer to this? Uh, mm-hmm. why, haven't they, yes. why haven't we seen them yet? Uh, well, of course, one possibility is there aren't. There yep. aren't many of them, um, but of course, this is an important debate. It's, a, it's about the only bit of data that we have which is relevant to the question, the fact that we haven't been visited by these aliens. Of course, some people think they have. I mean, you, you talk, talked about... <laughs> you, well, you, talk, you yes. talked about uh, what does the Astronomer Royal do. Yes. Uh, he gets a lot of letters from people uh, <laughs> who, um, uh, who um, uh, think... Uh, um, uh, uh, who, who say they know the answer because they, they, they've, uh, they've been abducted, uh, they've, they've met the aliens, etc. And I, I say two things to these people. I say, first, do you really think that if the aliens have made this huge effort to traverse interstellar space, would they just meet one or two well-known cranks and then go away again and make a corn circle or something? And secondly, I say they should write to each other and not to me. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, but, but, but more seriously, I think we, uh, um, we can be fairly sure we haven't uh, been visited, um, but uh, um, that doesn't mean then there's not something out there. Um, uh, and of course, what's out there could be um, inconceivably different from us. But it does, of course, there are two stages. One is the question of is there any life out there at all? And of course, it's important to realize that we don't know how life began on Earth. We understand Darwinian evolution from protozoa to us in three and a half billion years or so, but we don't know what caused the basic transition from complex chemistry to the first replicating, metabolizing entity that we call alive. We still don't understand that. Uh, People are starting to work seriously on it. But until we understand that, we don't know whether it was a rare fluke here or whether it would be expected to happen on any of these so-called habitable planets. But one other piece of data is that it did start pretty early in Earth's history of habitability at all. Well, monocellular, as as bomb... monocellular ones did, right, but then right. the, the, the later stage of going to multicellular ones took, took two time. billion years. Um, yeah. and, uh, and of course, that uh, makes us aware that the fact that you've got simple life doesn't mean necessarily that it will evolve anything like it has yeah. here on Earth. To, but still, to there's quite a lot of those planets. So, you know, mm. what's your ultimate thinking? Um, well, uh, I, I, I suspect it has evolved to something very interesting on some of these planets, um, although we can't rule out the possibility where you live. Yeah. Um, but, of course, the, the, uh, uh, if we ask about what we should look for, and, of course, uh, uh, one of the things I've been discussing at the conference today is the uh, um, Yuri Milner's plan to expand s- search to the so-called Breakthrough Listen project to do a deeper search by more techniques for something that's manifestly unnatural as narrow band transmission or pulses or something like that. Um, But if we detected that sort of thing, um, uh, it's not clear if it would be from what we call a civilization. Let me expand on this a bit, because uh, supposing that um, uh, aliens have been watching the the Earth, um, then for three or four billion years they'd have seen evidence for life, which they could have um, the understood the atmosphere, a non-equilibrium atmosphere, etc. And then they would have seen evidence of technology. Yep. Um, uh, first, um, changing, the, Very recently. Uh, changing the surface, the kind of things that your satellites can detect. And then, of course, the technology, radio emission and all that. But if we think ahead, then uh, I don't know how long it's going to take to have uh, the machines taking over. Uh, some people, maybe some in this audience, think it'll happen in 30 years, but even, uh, um, even lots of uh, conservative people think it'll happen in a few centuries. Um, and that will therefore mean that uh, the machines will have billions of years ahead, because the other thing we learned from astronomy is that the time lying ahead is at least as long as the time up to now. The sun's less than halfway through its life. 
The sun has five billion years ahead of it, and the universe may go on forever. Eternity is very long, especially towards the end, as Woody Allen said. Um, and um, so, so, uh, so we are not the end point of evolution. We're not even halfway stage. And if you think of what's happened on the Earth, what might happen in future, then what we call an organic civilization that we are part of will just be a thin sliver between pre-civilization, four billion years, and machine-dominated civilization, another few billion years. And so if we detect another planet where there's been evolution, and if it's gone anything like uh, uh, what happened here on Earth, it's most unlikely to be synchronized to the extent that we would catch it in this sliver of time when yeah. it's dominated by, uh, by uh, organic creatures. Um, it'll be in the machine age. So if we detect something, yeah. uh, if the breakthrough <coughs> listen project succeeds, uh, anything it detects, I think, won't be a sort of message. It'll be some sort of burping or malfunctioning of some interstellar machine. Right. Because once we get to the machines, they don't want to be on the Earth. On the Earth. They don't want gravity, they don't want an atmosphere. So right. I think the most likely thing we'd detect would be some free-floating machine, which would be the creation of some long-dead civilization. Right, and the, the other aspect of that is, of course, as you get more efficient in general with technology, you, yes. you, don't, you tend to send out less random signals right, because, so that's, that's, because right. that's energy inefficient. Y yes. So you don't just send signals all over the place. Yes. So, so the, you tend that, to, that's right. yes. with so, time... Uh, and so uh, you know, radio is necessarily the best bet. Right. Um, and, uh, uh, and so they are going to look for optical pulses right. and things like that. Um, but of course, even if we detect something which is manifestly artificial, very narrow band signal or something like that, um, I think the chance that that is a message is a second order in probability, as it were. Yes. Um, it's, um, uh, it's far more likely it'll be just uh, some, some pulse or something like that. Um, and, of course, as, as you say, um, radio may not be the best bet. And, of course, if, if it's a message not intended for us, but intended for, for their internal communications, then, of course, as uh, people here know better than me, um, the best way to compactify a message is to make it as like noise as possible. Right. Okay, and, and so uh, it'd be very hard to... Um, Distinguish. To, yes, just like 50 years ago, uh, um, a, a radio engineer would have been perplexed by, uh, by FM, you know, when they just said AM, you know, and, and, and so it's right. quite unlikely to decode it. So, so I'm very pessimistic about the idea of having a message that we can decode, even if SETI right. discovers anything. But, but uh, I would say that um, just detecting anything that's manifestly artificial would be um, uh, a huge yeah. development. It would show that somewhere out there, uh, there were uh, entities uh, which had developed technology, um, and uh, whether they were entities which had consciousness like, and, uh, and uh, wet brains like we have or something quite different, we wouldn't know. But I think it's a worthwhile quest, even though the chance of success is small. So I'm yes. very glad that Yuri Miller is doing this, because right. uh, if he wasn't doing it, the chance of finding it in our lifetime would be zero. Right. At least it's more than zero now. That's right. And, and, and you know, I, I, I also think that the, the work of SETI and others to systematically think about this, as hard as the problem is, is yeah. really important. In fact, it, it always boggles my mind that there's so little attention to this because of the groundbreaking difference it would make if we mm. did find intelligent life. Yes, and, and of course, as a consequence of that, it has depended on private philanthropists. I mean, Yuri is the most recent one, was Barney Oliver, who's, yeah. who made a major donation, $35 million a long time ago, and so uh, there's been no public money. And in fact, yeah. I, I personally think uh, there's no reason why there shouldn't be, because, for instance, um, if I was an American, um, uh, and I, and I asked the people coming out of some science fiction movie, would they be happy if some of the tax from that movie was hypothecated for SETI? I think a lot would say yes. And actually, I'd be happier defending public money being spent on SETI than I would uh, defending it being spent on an accelerator, because there's far more public interest. Then, uh, on, on, an, on an accelerator. Okay. Because there's far more public interest. And incidentally, for... Uh, mm. uh, it turns out that the people who are least keen on SETI are often the astronomers. And the reason for that is that they think that the money right, which is spent the and the telescope time will come at the expense of their mainstream astronomy. And, of course, it shouldn't. I mean, if SETI is going to be right. publicly funded, it should be regarded as something of interest to all humanity, as right. it were, or certainly a wider set of humanity than uh, astronomers. Yeah, so in my opinion, I mean, it's just off by several orders of magnitude how much attention we're putting on it. I bet, you know, it's mm -hmm. like NASA's budget is 0.6%, and everyone yeah, yeah. would guess it's 30 or something. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. anyway, um, mm -hmm. but, uh, but one thing that 
is perhaps more promising than, the, than just the search for intelligence is, is being able to find life on other planets because now we've detected lots of planets mm -hmm. looking for atmospheric uh, imbalances that we yeah. would find of the like of looking at our own. Yes. It, it really is near-term prospects. So yes. we should be able to find life if there is any and, and understand the distribution of that pretty quickly. In, in, indeed, to find if, if there's a biosphere. And uh, to, to give this, a simple analogy, which I like to give, um, <clears throat> supposing that... Uh, um, aliens with a telescope like our biggest telescopes uh, was say 10 light years away and looking at the solar system then the sun would look an ordinary star the earth would look in Carl Sagan's nice phrase a pale blue dot very close in the sky to its star our sun and much 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 fainter but if the aliens watched the pale blue dot carefully they'd find the shade of blue would be different depending on where the Pacific Ocean or the land mass of Asia was facing them so they could infer the length of the day, that there were continents and oceans, something about the seasons, and by taking the spectrum, they could infer that, uh, uh, the that there was lots of green stuff, and etc. Yeah. And that's just the kind of thing we'd be able to do in 10 years' time. Right, for uh, other planets. Regarding Earth-like planets around and other stars. That's very exciting. Tantalizing prospect. I'm, mm -hmm. I'm so excited about that. Mm -hmm. and, um, um, but, but keeping on the theme of intelligence, but swapping from the SETI kind to the AI kind, yes, um, yes. You've spoken a lot about AI and the, the, the threats of AI, and uh, there's a lot of people in the Bay Area mm, mm. who uh, think about this. And uh, um, I was uh, chatting with Peter Norvik, who's here, mm. um, um, yeah, yeah. just before this, and, mm. and I was joking with him that it's almost all physicists that, um, that are worried about AI, and it's almost all computer scientists that yeah. are, are not mm. at all, yeah, and yeah. saying, oh, stop worrying about this. And yes. I, you know, on the one hand, you can say the physicists don't know what they're talking about yeah. because <laughs> uh, they don't know about computer science. Yes, yes, yes. And you can also say, on the other hand, the computer mm. scientists, of course, can't see the wood for the trees. Yeah, yeah. And, mm. and in fact, I think there's some, there's some merit to that, not least because yes, I'm a physicist, yes. but also because, <laughs> um, because the, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the you know, physicists went through this relatively serious episode with nuclear weapons mm -hmm. um, and realizing that they can't just think of their inventions as being something that's abstract from mm -hmm. uses. They can't think of themselves in the mm -hmm. ivory tower mm -hmm. no. anymore. And, and, and I think that's high in physicists' minds when they're looking at this, uh, yes. this challenge. But, yeah. Yes, w yes. Well, I mean, uh, we do need to be concerned, obviously. But, but let me correct you. I mean, I, I'm not one of these people who's ter terrified. And yes. I think the, the field's been damaged by high-profile people, in yes. particular Stephen Hawking and Elon Musk. Yes. neither of whom is a particular expert on this subject, yes. and they always get quoted. Whenever there's an article, right. it said uh, that uh, uh, Stephen Hawking and Elon Musk say it's going to kill us all, etc., which, uh, you know, they've got no grounds for saying that at all. So I, I'm not, uh, I'm not one of them. But, but I mean, to, to say this, uh, um, I, 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 uh, we have a group in Cambridge which uh, um, is, is trying to, to study um, these sort of extreme risk from technology uh, in a, we hope, a sensible way by sort of convening experts to decide what is something we need to worry about and what could be Mr. Science Fiction. And, of course, we, we talk to the deep mind people and others and, uh, and all that. And, uh, um, you know, many people think that one needs to sort of think about responsible innovation, doing things in the right order, etc. But to be honest, I, I'm not the person who worries about, about this. There are issues, of course, which we can discuss in a minute, but I worry far more about bio. Yes. I mean, I think, you know, the, the, the risks of misuse of, of bio when it's such a fast-developing uh, dual-use technology, so accessible, uh, that, that really terrifies me. That's, that's my number one theory. But, but it's, of course, uh, in, in terms of, uh, of AI uh, and uh, robotics, then, uh, of course, um, in, the, in the short run, there's the issue about changing the labor market. That's a, a very familiar to everyone yeah. here. Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, and, of course, it's going to um, affect um, uh, professional people, medical diagnostics, legal work, coding and many other things. Um, the harder jobs to automate are things, something like being a gardener yes. and service, being, a, being a plumber and things yep. like that in services. Um, and my personal view, if I can inject a bit of socialism to this audience, is that we need massive redistribution so that the money uh, earned by the robots is used to set up a large number of posts, um, dignified and properly paid posts, as carers for young and old and gardeners in public parks and things like that. Because certainly uh, the, the uh, yeah. uh, old people, if they can afford it, they want a real carer. 
not a machine. Right. And uh, so we ought to provide dignified work for uh, people using the money earned by the robots of that kind, where the human touch is very important. And that's far better than the idea of, of giving people a living wage for doing nothing. You've got to uh, set up jobs of that kind. So that's what, what I would deal with that. There's another issue which is coming up now, which is that um, uh, the, the, um, uh, the, the generalized machine learning uh, technique uh, allows the computer to do things where the programmer doesn't know how it does it, of course. So, um, <laughs> The contrast between 20 years ago when the uh, chess playing uh, computer beat Kasparov, that was programmed by experts, whereas the uh, computer that beat the world champion at Go, and more recently the, uh, the Carnegie Mellon one that, uh, that, that played uh, poker very well, um, the programmers don't know exactly how they make their decisions. And likewise, if you have a, a computer uh, which is analyzing a huge amount of data, um, uh, it can um, perhaps uh, uh, find new correlations and decide who's got a propensity to certain diseases, etc. It may not be able to explain it very well. Right. Uh, and this, this, is a, this is a problem. These are near-term problems. Of course, um, the science fiction uh, issue is the, the question of um, uh, General, will they take over? Yes, yeah. will they take over? Will they, uh, because, of course, as, as we know, that they, uh, um, they can't interact with the external world very well. You know, tying shoelaces is pretty hard for them and things... And uh, things like that. But so, are you worried about that in the long term? Uh, well, I mean, uh, I, I think uh, I, I'm not not sure. I'm, uh, I, I defer the, some of the world's biggest experts in the audience, so I, I don't feel I should say very much. But, uh, but they might not be able to see the wood for the trees. Well, I'm sure they can. <laughs> Um, no, I'm, I'm sure they can, but of course, what, what one does need the, the obvious concerns about yes. the robots running out of control and uh, getting control of the Internet of Things, etc. But I worry far less about this than about bio. Um, and, yes. uh, um, but, uh, and, and of course, the, the idea that they will sort of take over completely um, is, um, is, is, is also something that people talk about. I, I think the real arena for the robots is in space. Um, you know, uh, they, will t they, they will take over there. Um, but uh, on the earth, I, I, I don't know. But of course, there are these philosophical questions. I mean, what, one, of course, is um, whether consciousness is an emergent property, which they would all have, or is consciousness peculiar to the particular kind of uh, wet hardware that we have. And this is, I think, uh, a Im very important question. Philosophers, philosophers debate it because uh, I know I've once or twice written articles about this and I, I wrote an article um, saying that um, in the long run machines may take over and uh, uh, have cogitations far deeper than any human brain can have. And uh, I got uh, mixed reactions because some people thought, well, this is great. This is people that be more self-aware, deeper thoughts of all kinds. Whereas others thought that these would be just zombies and that if there's no consciousness in the universe, the universe loses its value. So the question of whether these intelligences have, have self-awareness and consciousness is, I think, very important yeah. in the way we re react to a possible takeover by them. Right. Uh, so, but uh, if I can... Um, I, I think it's important that we, we, we try and bridge this divide because it did get too, like, mm. you know... Uh, if you like, raised mm. up too quickly, and uh, yes. and, uh, and and there be lots of extreme scam. Absolutely, scam on both here. sides, yes, in yes. a way that was kind of silly, and yes. and actually, if you look at it, a lot of it was to do with the difference of time scale. I mean, yeah. the computer scientists were uh, were talking about the near term, and mm. those mm. physicists were talking about the long term, yeah, yeah, and yeah. and the respective time scales, they weren't so off. You know, mm. there aren't any near term challenges like that. I mean, the mm. labor ones are near term, but the, mm. yep, not yep, the yep. AGI ones. Mm. Whereas the long term. You know, there is a challenge there. Yeah, yeah. Although I, I think another thing to mention about this is that, of course, AI can, you know, if you think about the basket of challenges, if you think about existential threats, mm -hmm. uh, th as you think a lot about, um, mm. as you mentioned, probably bioweapons and other things are, are higher up there. Mm. And, and, of course, AI can potentially help with those. And of if course. you think about it on a net basis, you might probabilistically think that it's more likely to help mitigate those and then and, and create a new one or that, that, that at least that be benefit yes. outweighs the cost mm. yes. although it does introduce a new danger mm. yes but i think in ma many contexts the order in which different technologies develop it makes a big matters. difference to the risk and that's, and that's something one, one can address and perhaps uh, um, you know governments can sort of tweak the rate of development of different technologies in, in a yes. way that is to minimize these risks but uh, on the bio front i mean uh, what i find so scary is that um, it, uh, 
um, it, it only needs fairly modest equipment. And uh, to, give, to, to just expand on this a bit, um, 40 years ago, there was a conference in Asilomar uh, when recombinant DNA came in, um, and they, they, people decided on a certain moratorium, a certain kind of experiment, etc., and that was enforced. And now they've been having similar inter-academy type meetings to decide how to regulate the gain-of-function experiments on viruses um, and uh, CRISPR techniques and all that. Um, and uh, uh, th they think there should be some regulation. But the big difference now is whether you can enforce the regulations. Because now, of course, the, uh, uh, the technology is global, the people, scientists all over the world, and there's uh, huge commercial pressures. And uh, my, uh, my fear is because uh, I don't think we'll be able to enforce those regulations any more than we can globally enforce the drug laws or the tax laws. We've had not much chance of either of those. And so that, that's why I feel that uh, whatever we say, uh, whatever can be done will be done somewhere right. by someone. So, and this is rather scary because, yes. of course, we all know what the uh, possible things uh, that can be done in the next 10 years Absolutely. are like. Mm. Which brings us back, we need the backup plan. Anyway, but... Uh, <laughs> But uh, let me just, um, I, I'm perhaps going to open it up to questions in may, may, maybe just a few minutes to start noodling. Um, but uh, just a f final topic, I mean, this, this AI stuff has helped to awaken mm -hmm. a little bit of uh, thinking in the Bay Area in particular about mm -hmm. technology and its role in society. And um, these are topics I know you care a lot about. Uh, mm -hmm. You're part of the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists and other things. And mm -hmm. uh, we've both been involved a little bit in the Pugwash movement, which mm -hmm. is those scientists caring about nuclear weapons yeah, yeah. And, it's mm -hmm. in, and how to stop them. Um, and, um, but actually, it's interesting, um, I would say, having spent 10 or 12 years here, uh, mm -hmm. you haven't had that delight. Um, but uh, the, uh, the, the, there is some interesting, I think, philosophical assumptions in, amongst the te tech community here, one of which is that essentially, technology equals progress, that anything mm -hmm. you invent, any gadget, anything that's new, it's going to lead to benefit. And that, you know, things like code is neutral. You, know, you put the code out there mm -hmm. and society mm -hmm. figures out how to use it. And I, I think that this is uh, a little bit uh, mistaken, in fact, a mm -hmm. lot mistaken. It's a philosophical mistake because you know, technology can always be used for good and bad. Mm -hmm. and, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and actually, how the technologists bring that about, um, how mm -hmm. the scientists steer that, matters a lot. They're not the only responsible agents, no, but they, no, are, yeah. they have responsibility. And um, this AI debate, and then more recently with the role that Facebook and Google and others and Twitter mm -hmm. played in creating fake news or, or aiding and abetting fake news and echo chamber effects mm -hmm. have led mm -hmm. to disastrous you know, um, mm -hmm. political yes. consequences, yes. Um, uh, you know, have woken people up to realize that their platforms aren't quite so neutral. Mm -hmm. And I think that this is actually quite an important dawning uh, for us to start thinking about yeah. technology and society. Um, do you yes. have any comments about this? No, I mean, certainly. It's, it's, and, I'm just winning on yes, a rant, and, really. And, but, uh, and, and bio, of course. I mean, I think the point that technology is getting more powerful, the stakes are higher, right. both for good and for, and for evil. And, of course, uh, the downsides um, are now global because we're in such an inter interconnected world. We couldn't have a disaster in one part of the, the world without without it affecting the rest. You, know, you may know the book by Jared Diamond on collapse, where he talked about different styles of collapsing. I think now, if one part of the world collapses, the rest will cascade and collapse the same way. So we are vulnerable because we're interconnected. Um, but uh, of course, the role of scientists. I think scientists do have a special responsibility to engage. And of course, as you said at the beginning, the post-war um, uh, atomic scientists who worked in Los Alamos, they returned to civilian work, but they... Uh, uh, thought they had an obligation to try and control the powers they'd helped unleash. And uh, great men like uh, Hans Bethe and Rotblat uh, did this and set an example that needs to be followed by people in other sciences. Um, uh, they, of course, um, can't control it, but uh, to give an analogy, it's rather like um, uh, if you've got teenage kids, you can't necessarily control them, but you're a poor parent if you don't care what happens to them. And likewise, if you created some idea, then you ought to care about ensuring that it's uh, used for good, if it can be, and uh, to try and minimize the downside. But of course, having said that, uh, let's recall that um, the way science is applied is not a decision just for scientists. Right. Uh, because the scientists, uh, they're experts on technology, 
but uh, in deciding how something should be they applied, can't see the the trees either. they're just citizens. Yeah. Okay, and yeah. I think scientists have to realise that. And this comes up very much in the climate debate and uh, energy debates and all that, uh, where scientists sometimes uh, speak as though they're experts on policy, but most policies have a scientific dimension now, whether it's energy, environment, etc. But of course, also involves um, 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 politics, uh, economics, and ethics as well, where they're just citizens, and so we need to accept that. But, but, but I would say the, the, the position has to be made a little bit stronger. It's not just that people have responsibility for their technological uh, mm -hmm. uh, adolescence, but, but actually when you're, when you're deciding whether to give birth, <laughs> mm -hmm. you, know, you should decide whether you, know, you should bring this uh, yes. technology into the world by, yes. by thinking about well, the Well, if you can predict it, but the trouble is that you can't. I mean, to take yes. a classic yeah. example, the laser. Yeah. Uh, you, you know, uh, when uh, uh, yeah. the laser was invented, um, they had no idea if it would be used for eye surgery and for weapons, you know, right. it wasn't clear right. at all. And so I think at the time the yeah. key idea is developed, people may not yeah. be able to do that. And so uh, the, 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 it may be best to let them get on with it, yeah. but then make sure that the regulation comes in at a later stage. Well, fair enough. And I mean, I think the nuclear weapons cases are kind of unique in this yeah. situation because yeah. it required such a large effort yes. Yes. that that's the kind of thing you could conceivably say, well, it wouldn't have happened mm. at least for Absolutely. some time. Yeah. Yeah. But there are a lot of the other technologies aren't that, that way. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Let me uh, just have a final question. Uh, I wanted to bring it back to something really uh, big and uh, a bit more light. Um, uh, and then we'll uh, open it to uh, the audience questions. So um, when I was studying uh, uh, astronomy, uh, uh, I, I learned certain things that now seem to be overturned. You know, you know, there's dramatic things happening in cosmology. There's really a mm -hmm. data boom. And uh, so, so I've just, uh, I'm, I'm curious myself, and I'm sure others are too, uh, is the universe uh, finite or infinite these days? And uh, is it closed or open? <laughs> uh well, um, I think I'm just, you know, I mean, we don't yes, have to care yes. about it for the lunch, for well, dinner well, and uh, tomorrow, but like, yes. uh, what's the latest? Well, in fact, we can't, we can't answer either of those questions, but uh, let me say, say two things. Um, we, can, we can talk um, about the universe back to when it was a nanosecond old with as much confidence as a geologist could talk about the early history of the Earth. Okay, but within the first nanosecond, things no get idea. a bit more. Uh, we, we have some th some theories, we have some clues, but uh, but things are uncertain. And the reason they're uncertain is that in the first nanosecond, conditions are far more extreme than we can simulate in a lab. So the physics is itself conjectural. So that, that's one problem. But I think the, uh, the, the the two other things which I'd like to say, and that is that um, the universe, in the sense of everything there is is much bigger than the observable universe. Yeah. Yeah. Almost certainly, um, there's a, uh, a lot more beyond our horizon. And the horizon, the distance we can see with our telescopes, the greatest distance that light can have got to uh, from since the Big Bang. But that's just like the horizon if you're on a boat in the middle of the ocean. You don't think the ocean ends there. And uh, I think there's strong reasons for suspecting that the u universe goes on at least 100 times further than that. And it may go on much, much, much further than that, so far that all combinatorial options are repeated, and there's another um, uh, replica of this lecture room, and we all have avatars, and there might be some comfort that uh, if you make a, a goofy decision, uh, there might be an avatar that got things right somewhere far beyond the horizon. So that's a possibility. And that's not all, because that's the aftermath of our Big Bang. And the other thing which is now being taken very seriously is the idea that our Big Bang is just one of many. Um, and uh, an idea of, of uh, repetitive things. And in fact, one of the high priests of this is uh, Andre Linde here at Stanford, Stanford yeah. who has the idea of eternal inflation, that there are many, many Big Bangs. And also those Big Bangs may be governed by different laws there. And uh, uh, I'd just like to end with the anecdote that uh, um, I was here at Stanford about 10 years ago um, on a panel on cosmology, um, and uh, we were asked, how much would you bet on this multiverse idea? And I said, well, on the scale, would you bet your goldfish or your dog or your life? I was nearly at the dog level. And, and Andre Linde was on the panel, said, well, he spent 25 years of his life on this idea. He bet his life on it. <laughs> but then when told about this afterwards, the great uh, physicist Steve Weinberg said, uh, well, he'd happily bet Martin Rees's dog and Andre Linde's life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, um, so we, we, don't, we don't know. So I'd still almost bet my dog, but no more. I see. 
Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, maybe we can open it to, to questions, yeah. Um, so I believe they're mics, uh, so, yeah. Go back to the first part about you know uh, people going off into space and uh, so if it's reality, uh, the other groups that may actually be taken out into space are prisoners, slaves, and indentured labor, as has happened earlier when mm -hmm. new lands were discovered. Uh, and if it's actually happening within 30 years and not science fiction, what kind of legislative processes would we need on Earth, and what kind of resistances would we need to make sure that that doesn't happen again? Uh, well, uh, I hadn't thought about that one at all, actually. <laughs> <laughs> because the, 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 main, the main point is it's going to be so expensive that, uh, um, I mean, the, the problem is only, mil only millionaires are going to be able to go. I think actually only billionaires. Yeah, I, billionaires, I, I, yes. my, my gut is the same. Some, of them, that some of them may be criminals as well, of course. But uh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. In fact, there's probably a higher correlation. Yeah, yeah. No, but um, <laughs> no, but uh, uh, I, yeah. I agree that it, you yeah. know, it's very different yeah. from boats because of the, yeah. the cost per kilogram yeah, issue right. here. Yes. That it yeah. is, mm. I think, unlikely to mm. to create that circumstance. But uh, yeah. it's, I, I don't think I. But it's interesting. I hadn't thought much about that either. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Next question. Thank you. Um, my question is going back to the Fermi paradox a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. I wanted to ask about superstructures and both the likelihood that they are out there and mm -hmm. our ability to detect them. Um, if they are, and any thoughts on that? Yes, yeah. mm. well, I think that's an important point, that uh, if we're looking for evidence of uh, intelligence or technology, we shouldn't just look for electromagnetic signals, we should look for some sort of artifacts, and uh, uh, in two ways. One, we should uh, uh, look and see if there's some, something really huge out there, um, which has been restructuring a star or something like that, um, and we should look hard for that. And also, we should uh, look for something in our solar system, which may be left. You know, if some asteroid is specially shiny or something like that, we should be perplexed. You know, and so I think it's very important to to look for both these things. Um, and uh, uh, since we have no idea what this technology would be, we should just use all possible techniques and be open-minded about it. Uh, next question. A new class of extraordinary telescopes is being planned and built right now. Yes. What do you think the most exciting things that we'll be able to do with those extraordinary instruments will be? What do you think, what are you most looking forward to when those, those come online? Yes, um, well in fact the, um, uh, you, you think optical telescopes in particular? Yeah, you, yes, yes. Yes, well, well, the SK is, is a huge radio telescope that will uh, be far better at doing all these uh, searches for, um, uh, for artificial signals and, of course, mapping the universe. But the optical telescopes, there are, there are three being built, um, two uh, in America, um, well, built by Americans, one, uh, one in Hawaii and one in Chile. And uh, the biggest of all is being built by the Europeans, um, which is 39-meter uh, uh, Telescope means that the the, uh, the mirror is 39 meters across, and that's, I guess, really nearly, big, <laughs> ne nearly twice twice the size of, the, of this room, uh, huge, and it's a mosaic of 800 sheets of glass. And the Europeans aren't very imaginative regarding nomenclature, so it's called the ELT, which stands for Extremely Large Telescope. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, um, and, uh, and I've also heard there's the overwhelmingly <laughs> large telescope, the OWL. Well, the, 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 that Isn't was that abandoned. Right? That's going to be 100 meters. That okay, okay. That, that was going to be 100. Oh, it was yeah, abandoned, was it? Yeah, okay, that would okay. be the next one. But, so that was the next one. But the ELT, they, they've, uh, they started to build this, and, of course, the two American ones. The, the, the one called the 30-meter one in Hawaii is, is being stymied because of the uh, native Hawaiians uh, not wanting to get on their sacred mountaintops, so that's having big problems. But there's one called the Giant Magellan Telescope, which is equivalent to 25 meters, uh, which is being built in, Ch in Chile. Um, but uh, to answer your question, um, obviously these will allow us to uh, get sharp images and uh, go much deeper into space. But, but one, uh, one thing where they make a big difference 
um, is actually uh, in uh, studying planets around nearby stars because uh, um, you can just work out how many photons you need to gather in order to, dis to uh, uh, distinguish the spectrum of a planet from the spectrum of a star which is a million times brighter. You need to calculate huge numbers of photons and you need the collecting area of these big telescopes. So uh, there's a set of problems which they'll be able to tackle which just can't be done in a reasonable length of time now. Um, but they'll do other things as well. Um, and uh, I think if you look still further ahead, uh, then I think we'll have even bigger telescopes in space because going back to uh, what we were saying about the future of space, I can imagine that when we have robotic fabricators uh, which can uh, actually construct things in space and you're not limited to something which you can launch in a nose kind of a rocket, then it'll be possible to have uh, huge lightweight mirrors built under zero G which could be you know, kilometers across. I don't know. So that, that'll be the thing in the second half of the century, I think. Yeah. Um, so, so huge developments. And people are, in fact, experimenting with 3D printers in space now. There's one on the International Space Station sort of playing around. Right. With, and mm -hmm. it's pretty early days, but it's pretty cool. Yeah, uh, yes, so to, to actually build things on zero G is a lot easier. Yeah, uh, not, not yeah because I mean, yeah. when you're designing space stuff, it's all about the launch loads, and he's got to survive yeah. the 200 Gs mm. when the two s stages mm. separate. Yeah. That's but right. that's really a pain, but if you could launch a lump of plastic and a lump mm. of whatever and then yeah, start yeah, yes, printing yes. large structures, it makes a huge yes. amount of sense. And of course, if, if we're going to mine the asteroids or mine the moon, then there's a stronger case if you're going to use the stuff to build things in space rather than bring Absolutely. it down to Earth. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Okay, next question. <clears throat> I believe it's switched on. Does it work? It's working now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I believe there's a, a theory that there is a, another large planet out there beyond Pluto that's multiples of the Earth in mass, sort of, I don't know, seven or ten times the Earth or whatever. Mm. Um, do you think that's likely? And secondly, uh, who has the authority to name it? <laughs> And, and yeah. finally, what do you think the name should be? <laughs> okay. Uh, um, well, I, I think, uh, um, of course, there are a lot of uh, Pluto-sized objects further out, but this one you're mentioning, um, this has been inferred uh, because there's something special about the orbits of some of these, uh, um, the, these outer, uh, outer minor planets, which suggests they're all being tugged by some much bigger objects, uh, called... Um, uh, Professor Brown at Caltech has this idea. And uh, I think it's an interesting thing, so I would say it's worth looking for it. Uh, I'm not sure what, what odds I'd bet on it being there. Uh, it would be far out beyond, beyond Pluto. It might be there. Um, as to what to call it, um, I don't know. Of course, the, uh, the International Astronomical Union um, you know, has systems for naming different classes of objects. Um, and asteroids can be named after anyone, but uh, um, there's a system so... Uh, I think there'd be a public competition for the name if it was found. Uh, why not? <laughs> well, that's right, that's right. Yes, yes. No, um, no this was um, uh, uh, for the benefit of the, the non-Brits. You sound like a Brit, sir. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, there, was a there was a competition to, uh, to name the uh, big research ship for the Antarctic Survey. And uh, for some reasons, it was uh, uh, the winning entry was Boaty Boatface. <laughs> uh, and they uh, tried to not name it that for a while, and they, then they, they got they, overwhelmed yes, with and, public uh, support. Yes, yes, but but, but they but they turned off. So it was, instead, it was named after Sir David Attenborough. But <laughs> but they have now. It, it's got a sort of small uh, um, uh, unmanned submarine that it launches there, and that's been called oh, Boaty right? Boatface. Okay, yeah, yes, yeah, well, yeah, it's good. Yeah. I'm glad we cleared um, that up. Yeah. Next so that's that's a uh, you know public opinion doesn't always lead to a good result. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> <laughs> as you, know, really better than, as you right know better than most, yeah. <laughs> okay, no, yeah. next question. Yes. Yeah. Yes, sir. It will come Turn on. Turn it on. <laughs> it's on? Yeah. yeah so yeah. At, at the start of this conversation, you talked about the uh, Apollo program and yes. the landing on the moon, yes. which was a global... Well, I'm of an age that I remember yep, that. Yep, yep. Mm -hmm. And that truly had global impact yes. mm -hmm. and, I think, benefit to humanity, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but what drove it was superpower rivalry. Yes, There's yes. no question about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you think we will ever, are there, what do you see as the barriers and can we overcome them to making intelligent 
decisions that benefit all of humanity that aren't based on nationalism? Uh, We're straying well, away from science a little bit, yeah, here, yes. aren't we, Martin? Well, well uh, uh, I think it's true that was a unifying venture, just like discovering in terms of life would be a unifying uh, venture. Um, I, I think uh, we do have uh, to be more international because many of the uh, problems facing us, you know, uh, uh, dealing with a larger global population, um, dealing with climate change and all these things clearly have to be tackled globally. So we do, we do need to uh, have more of this kind of collaboration. And how we can uh, uh, ensure it, I mean, political leaders can help. Um, I think, incidentally, um, um, the religions can help. And perhaps I could mention that uh, um, the... Uh, uh, although I'm not, not a religious believer, I'm on the council of the Papal Academy of Sciences, which I think ha had a huge leverage a couple of years ago because it, it, it organized a conference on um, uh, uh, sustainability and climate, which was attended by some of the best climate scientists. It was co-organized by one of my colleagues, uh, um, Parthas Gupta, and Ram Ramanathan, who's a climate scientist at Scripps in uh, La Jolla, um, and it had the, the best, uh, um, Marcia McNutt and people like that, Jeffrey Sachs, Stiglitz, and top people. And that, I think, was an important impetus into the papal encyclical the following year um, on, uh, uh, on climate and environment. And that encyclical had a genuine major effect in Latin America, in Africa, and in East Asia, I think not in the U.S. Republican Party, unfortunately. Um, but, but, uh, but it did have a big, big effect and made it easier to get the consensus at the Paris Conference, which, of course, as you know, may be something which doesn't have a huge practical effect, but was symbolically very important. So I just quote this as an example that uh, um, the, the world's great religions do have value because whatever you think about the Catholic Church, you can't deny uh, its long-term vision, its global reach, and its care for the world's poor. And uh, those are the things that we need if we want to uh, uh, ensure that we can uh, um, survive this century um, and deal with these big challenges to, um, uh, for climate, environment, and biodiversity, and all the rest. If I can just um, uh, add a, a, a tiny bit. Um, I, I, obviously, we don't have the global institutions to deal with global problems today, right. whether that's right. global taxation mm -hmm. or climate change and so forth. And, um, the UN, you know, you can see isn't a powerful enough entity to do that. Um, and, it, mm -hmm. um, and the only time it was was under a situation where it was really all, everyone was behind the US and the Soviet Union. It was really two people uh, mm -hmm. uh, talking shop. But uh, um, I think it's only on the, on the back of wars that hum, nation states are willing to give up a little, so, little bit of sovereignty, which, of course, they have to do in order to have international institutions like that actually work, which mm -hmm. I can't see happening unless uh, Trump really causes another war. Mm -hmm. uh, but no... Basically, that's unfortunately the, the human nature. But, but tying it back to the International Astronomical, Astronomical Union, which I'm going to attempt to do, <laughs> um, uh, one way, of course, would be to create an, in, a threat from outside the Earth. And uh, the IAU <laughs> could just say there is an asteroid, and it's on its way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And yes, uh, yes. believe us, we're the astronomers. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. And, uh, you, mm. you, you know, they don't have the... It's too mm. faint for you guys to see with your mm. amateur telescopes, but mm. it's really there. Mm. And... Yes. <laughs> This yeah. would unify humanity mm. to that threat, no, right. and uh, mm, mm. A, a fake or a fake alien invasion. Yeah, some yeah, sort of, yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So mm. the astronomers could have the power to solve this problem yeah, after yeah, all. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. The okay. Next question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just piggybacking off of that uh, previous question, so regarding asteroids, so I just wanted to get a sense of in the uh, newspaper ones every so often you hear about uh, asteroids and near Earth missiles. So I wanted to get a sense of uh, how far ahead do you think? Uh, you should talk to the dinosaurs about that. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, yes. Um, well, uh, just a, a couple of things about asteroid risk. Um, uh, it's the risk that we can quantify fairly precisely. We know how many asteroids are of different sizes. We know the, their consequences. Um, and, uh, uh, and we've got data on various impacts. And uh, we, uh, as regards predictions, 
um, we can predict that we're not going to be hit by a very big asteroid in the next 200 years or so, um, but we, we, um, we can't predict the smaller ones because we only know about 2% of the asteroids um, above 50 meters, and a 50-meter asteroid could destroy a city. And so we, we, and that, that's why there are uh, programs to actually have more complete surveys, and uh, that's, that's a good thing. Um, but uh, one other thing, um, uh, the, the asteroid threat is something which is no higher for us than it was for the, uh, for the dinosaurs um, or, <laughs> um, or, or the Neanderthals, um, uh, whereas the, the threats that I worry about most are those much larger threats which are emergent and where we don't have a time base where we can, um, where we can uh, uh, assess the risk. So I worry more about the man-made dangers than about asteroids. But actually, one slightly technical point which I think about uh, um, um, Pareto distributions rather than Gaussians, um, and that's that um, uh, if, if you... Uh, the, the, it's, it's a true statement that the average number of people killed per year by, an astero by asteroids is about 100. Now, you might question that because it's also true that there's no historic record of anyone being killed by an asteroid. Uh, in the, okay. um, and the reason is that the, the risk is dominated by the rare big event. And, the, uh, uh, and, and, and that, that statement is, is, is because um, the chance of a dinosaur-scale asteroid coming and hitting the Earth within a 50-year period is a few times 10 to the minus 6. Okay, you multiply that by the, by the world's population, you get that number. And, and this is important because um, uh, the, the many, well, probably many people know that Mr. Taleb's book, The Black Swan and all that, where he makes a big deal of this. But uh, if you have this sort of 80-20 Pareto distribution, then um, you're below average 98% of the time, above average 2% of the time. And this therefore means that for uh, all these risks, the past is normally an underestimate of the risk of, of a big one coming. And, and that, that's a simple example where you can quantify it. Okay, next question. So I had a question about collective behavior and respectively among scientists and technologists. So for example, um, in technology, I agree it's a short history and things are emerging with AI and so forth, but these companies are sort of futurists don't seem to have resident ethicists or philosophers. Does your company have someone who works on something, say, like the Pledge, which was this thing that was nominated, as you probably know, for the Nobel Peace Prize against Star Wars years ago by some scientists yep. looking at technology and space and its impact? I mean, and with scientists, given the way things are in the world and there's the science march on Saturday, do you see an upcoming trend of collective behavior towards more analysis of the ethics yes. and um, mm. of the mm. systems mm. and structures with mm. these new technologies? <laughs> Yes. Yeah. I think Will should answer that, but I'd just like to say that, of course, science is, is the most global activity because uh, um, uh, protons and proteins are the same all over the world, you know, and so uh, science can straddle all barriers of faith and nationality more than other activities, and so it is global. But I think you can answer the question better than me. Well, I, I think it, um, in our company particularly, we have a little ethics committee thinking about these sort of things, and, <laughs> and I consider myself quite, um, uh, quite interested in ethics, so I care about it um, personally. Um, I don't think it's common in, it, you know, there's a little bit of, a, 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 occasionally in biotech companies, there's something like an ethics function, and definitely in hospitals there is, but um, it's rare, and I think uh, that needs to be addressed, um, and that that companies should have ethics uh, boards um, for whatever their technology is and to think through the implications uh, for helping to do that and, and to do that a little bit at arm's length. Um, and uh, we saw that recently with DeepMind and others on the AI side starting to think that, and I think that's really important. Um, and I also think it's important that uh, universities take this seriously. I mean, you know, one of the th ways we can help this in the long run is is teaching this to the students at Stanford that produce mm -hmm. half of these companies, you know? Mm -hmm. um, like, mm -hmm. the, it, I think it's the responsibility of, of the, uh, the, those institutions and professors and stuff there to be 
installing ethics just as much as the topics um, in those uh, folks. It shouldn't just be about growth, 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 and apps and whatever the hell they, they teach there, but you know, it should be about, um, and th that's really great. I mean, they, they, they spin out amazing companies, but not thinking about the ethics so much, you know? And I mm -hmm. think uh, it would be great if they added that a little bit more. Um, mm -hmm. I have an opinion so, about uh, fast radio bursts that have been in the news lately and their origins. Yes, ah, this is a technical thing. The, the, um, as Trump has discovered some radio bursts which last less than a millisecond um, and come from beyond our galaxy. And uh, um, it's probably, we don't, we don't know what it is, it's a mystery, but uh, my favorite view is that it's a kind of neutron star called a magnetar which when it forms has a magnetic field even stronger than a pulsar, 10 to the 11 Tesla, something like that. Um, and uh, when that field tries to readjust, it can produce the sort of uh, f uh, radiation which is observed. That, that's a hand-waving argument. So it's a, new, it's a new kind of astronomical phenomena. Of course, uh, um, some people say this is evidence for some extraterrestrial intelligence, but I think it has a natural explanation. But uh, it's an example of how we're finding new surprises in the sky all the time. I so suppose perhaps we just have two more questions. So next question. Yeah. Question. Um, can you decide from that screen? I will. Yeah. Uh, so this is regarding detecting light and signs of light. So I want to bring this back to our solar system. Uh, so as of now, the agency is going through debating whether we want to go back to Europa or mm -hmm. Titan. Um, well, I mean, uh, from what I know, I mean, um, under the ice of Enceladus or Europa does seem to be a good bet if one can observe it. And of course, um, it's very, very important to see if there is life because so long as we only know about life here on Earth, it's logically possible to say that life doesn't exist anywhere else in the universe. It could be that a rare fluke and that's where we are. Okay. But supposing that you found evidence of life um, under the ice of Europa or Enceladus, it would have had an independent origin from life on Earth. And so if life originated twice within one solar system, that straight away indicates that it's in, it exists in billions of places in our galaxy. Okay? It can't be a rare thing if it happens twice in one solar system. And so detecting any kind of life in Enceladus or somewhere like that, which originated independently, would immediately answer one of the most important questions. We say life must be very common. Okay. So in other words, I'm very, very much in favor of anything you can do to, uh, to firm up. But uh, of course, um, since you're from NASA, it's 20 years since Cassini was launched. And what an amazing project that's been. You know, it's using very old technology, as we said, um, but it's been uh, orbiting around Saturn's moons for a decade or so, doing fantastic things. And, uh, uh, and just, just think how amazing that is. And uh, uh, it's found out how mysterious these moons are. Okay, final question. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, there's two mics, are there? Okay, we'll have two final questions. Fine. <laughs> go, 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 go. Yeah. Go, go. Um, so, uh, kind of a random string of thoughts, but I was curious about either of your thoughts on uh, potentially migrating away from chemical-based propulsion systems, um, and how astronomers, uh, or just as a general population, we might prepare better for astronomical disasters like Apophis or gamma ray bursts um, beyond looking for neutrino fluxes. So just to clarify, chemical propulsion in space, not down yeah. here. Yeah. So chemical yeah. propulsion and disasters like gamma ray bursts and apophis yeah. and all the yeah. fun stuff. Well, you can do it with propulsion, OK. Well, I, I think we're already going to see that move away for, for space pretty quickly. Um, yeah. uh, because from an efficiency standpoint, you want to move to ion drives and other, mm. other things. And, yeah, yes. uh, we, so we'll see that. I mean, the, 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 the main reason things are done with uh, chemical propulsion today is just to get in off the Earth bit, which you need so much thrust for yeah. mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. um, you, you, you use chemical rockets. There's not many other alternatives. Nuclear rockets are one, but it's got its downsides. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> <laughs> um, they yeah. really looked in that into yeah, the 60s, yeah, yeah. by the way. Yeah, um, yes, yes. You, you have the other yep. No, uh, I agree with that. I mean, the other possibility is, uh, is to, to use, uh, use lasers to fire something, but that's very inefficient. 
Um, but that's a possibility. Um, but on, on the other question about protecting against disaster, um, I think um, these disasters from the sky, um, asteroids, a nearby supernova or gamma ray burst, um, they're very unlikely. They don't keep me awake at night. So uh, although uh, we, we should try and defend against them if we can, um, if you work out the insurance premium you're prepared to pay uh, <laughs> uh, by multiplying the um, consequence by the probability that in the case of asteroids, you come up with a number like uh, $100 million a year worldwide, but you come up with even less, I think, for those other disasters. So just this last, very last uh, quick much. question. There is. Um, my original question was... Um, how do you prevent the Third World War? But you kind of touched upon this earlier. So my alternative question, which is related, is how do you encourage the general public to be more interested in science? Um, ah, that's a very good question to end on. Um, well, of course, um, I think many of the public are interested in science. And uh, um, uh, what, what amazes me is the amount of interest in in things like uh, that are entirely relevant. And of course, many teachers make the mistake of thinking you've got to make science relevant, which is completely wrong, because what do l young kids want to know about? is dinosaurs and space, <laughs> both completely irrelevant to their everyday lives, but fascinating. And so you've got to start off with what fascinates young people and then uh, work, work from there. Um, and it's important that we should, because um, uh, science isn't just for scientists. Um, and uh, the, the point is that any citizen uh, needs to be aware of at least basic ideas of science and probability, etc., to participate properly in debate. And if you want these debates to get above the level of slogans, then people have to have some feel for uh, um, you know, quantities and uh, um, uh, ways of getting energy and environmental concerns and things like that. So everyone needs to know some science. Uh, in order to be a responsible citizen, it seems to me. And uh, uh, to ensure that, it's a matter for educators and the media, um, but it starts with uh, uh, young kids. And, of course, they start being very enthusiastic about science. And uh, all too often, I think, in both our countries, they get turned off um, in the uh, secondary school, the teenage years, um, by uh, uninspiring teaching. Okay. Right. Uh, I think you're going to do a closing something. Thank you so much. Um, on behalf of our audience and Cambridge in America and Churchill Club, thank you so much for sharing your perspective so candidly. We really appreciate it very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. A very small token of our appreciation we have for each of you the Churchill Club speaker t shirt. <laughs> Please thank, wear you. Yeah, thank, you. Good thanks very right, thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thanks again to our sponsor, Chromium, and Simon Crosby, without whose help this would not have happened. Uh, Cambridge in America's next local event is next Thursday, the 82nd annual boat race dinner in San Francisco. And you can catch Churchill Club on May 2nd for connecting everything while everything is in motion, and on May 24th for the 19th annual Top 10 Tech Trends Debate. A recording of this program will be soon available on the Churchill Club YouTube channel, where you'll find recordings of our other programs also. Hope you find that to be a useful resource. You've been a wonderful audience. Thank you so much. Good night. Thank you.